Hello and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all those joining from different time zones today. Welcome to the Institute for Critical Study of Society Sunday morning program of 18 June 2023. My name is Raj Sahai, who, along with Jean Rule and six other members of the committee, organize the ICSS Sunday lecture discussion programs. This session, like those before it, is being videotaped and we will be available on YouTube uh, channel uh, ICSS Marxist and also on our website, icssmarks.org uh, later this week. You can, if you're not, uh, if you want to get announcements for future programs, you can go to icssmarks.org. Then there is a pop-up that will come up that will uh, ask you to give your introduction to yourself and your email, and then you'll get the notices for future programs. So the opinions expressed in our lectures, workshops, publications are only those of its authors. We are united, however, in our respect for the work of Karl Marx. And inspired by his 11th thesis on Feuerbach, which says, philosophers have explained the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. In that spirit, the Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebel Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland was formed in 2004. It, the purpose was to preserve Marx's revolutionary heritage and to support struggles for racial and gender justice and for that of the struggle of, for socialism leading on to communism uh, uh, in the world. So that's that's our motto and that's our goal. So Lenin in his book, Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, written in 1916, described it as a monopoly stage of capital, where finance becomes a dominant force and industrial capital and finance capital merge. Lenin wrote that at this stage, capitalism becomes moribund. Its vitality is gone. How this is shaping Indian economy is the subject of today's talk. Our guest speaker today is Professor Rahul Verman, who teaches in the faculty of the Department of Management at the Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur, located in the heart of the largest Indian state, Uttar Pradesh, with a population of over 200 million. He has followed in the footsteps of Professor A.P. Shukla, who some of you will recall has spoken in our ICS Sunday Forum at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library in the past two decades. He, along with his partner, that is Rahul with his partner, Manali Chakravarti, and fellow faculty member Suchitra Mathur, and some radical students and faculty joining, organized the contract workers on the campus, which number around 2,500 now. There are some other uh, workers for whom A.P. Shukla struggled. I think there are about three to 400. They've gotten their right, they're permanent, but these are contract workers, they're not permanent. These are the most exploited, the contract, work, contract workers are the most exploited and oppressed of the Indian working classes and come from local and far off areas of the country, often brought by labor contractors who also more often than not fleece them separately, separate from what goes on in, in their workday life. We will have a discussion after a brief intermission for announcements in the question and comment sections. With that said, please join me in warmly welcoming our guest speaker, Professor Rahul Borman. Uh, am I audible? Thanks, Raj. Uh, thanks for this 
generous uh, introduction. Am I audible clearly? Yes. Okay. What I'll do is uh, let me share my screen. Is it visible to all of you? Yes. All right. Okay, so uh, thanks very much, uh, Raj, and uh, all of you at ICSS uh, for inviting me for this talk. And I hope uh, it will be worth your time on a Sunday morning. That's why what I was thinking, it's a nice Sunday morning, and uh, you're going to listen to me. And uh, I hope it's worth your time. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, a couple of uh, challenges here. One, I think most of you in this audience won't be uh, familiar with India's context, um, especially India's context of big business, uh, which I'm going to talk about. And then the specificities also of the telecom sector. So um, I'll have to get into some details and talk about some specifics. Uh, uh, if you can, uh, if your questions can come later, that's also fine. But if you think that you need to stop me anywhere, anyway, as Raj said, and you know, from my side, definitely, it's a it's a kind of a conversation, and I really look forward to your your feedback and comments. Uh, you know, and and so just feel free to stop me anywhere, and I'll try to keep it to uh, 45, 50 minutes. Uh, and not go beyond that. I, I hope that sincerely that I'll do that. Um, so, um, you know, I'll, with this, I'll, I'll take up, I think first thing itself is that, uh, why do we need to even talk about um, this sector, this, um, you know, this telecom sector? And actually, uh, if you look around at the hype in India right now, and not only hype, the reality also around, I think, uh, you know, in, in at least in my, uh, you know, whatever years of observation, there has not been an industry like telecom and there has not been a service. Uh, some people are, I think, waiting for entering. Uh, they're in the waiting room. Somebody can. Uh, so, uh, so there has not been a, a, not been a, you know, anything like, like a telecom service. And that's one thing which intrigued me to kind of follow and, it's all very messy for multiple reasons, as you will see, to study a sector like telecom. One, remember when we talk about monopoly capital, it's completely opaque. Anywhere in the world, it's very, very opaque. It's very hard to get what really is happening here. And it's only certain kind of uh, fault lines or certain kind of uh, difficulties uh, which happens. I mean, sometimes some things come out in the press or somewhere in the margins. So last couple of years, I have been trying to, you know, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, various kinds of pieces I have been trying to put together and uh, make some sense of it. The, the thing is that why, why do we need to do it in the first place? As I said, first thing is that now literally you will see, even when we go to workers meeting, you will see a phone in every hand. And remember when we are talking about India, we are talking about a country of, uh, this is the large, most populous country in the world. And you know, a country which is extremely all said and done, it's, if you cut out the hype of the global media and our uh, ruling elite, it's a country which is extremely poor and uh, people live in very, very trying circumstances where you don't have drinking water, you don't have places for people to, you know, ease themselves, uh, you know, people don't have places to stay, uh, you know, etc. And yet you are saying there is a phone now almost in every hand. I mean, we saw it very dramatically during COVID time. When you are saying that people's lives, uh, you know, in one of the most brutal, I think, uh, lockdown anywhere in the world, the only thing their lives literally hung by was their phones. I'll use phones, I'll use mobile. So just uh, bear with me. Another thing is I'm going to use Indian rupee to bring, I'm going to talk a bit about money here, unfortunately, I'm going to talk about numbers. I'm going to use uh, Indian rupee mostly only in millions and billions and trillions, of course. I mean, I'm going to talk about big money. But just to give you a quick this thing, in mid-1990s, uh, dollar was 31 rupees. Uh, by 2000, a dollar became 45 rupees. 
2008 around 2008 crisis there was a lot of fluctuation by but by 2011 dollar was 62 rupees 2020 it was 70 and it has further fallen uh, since 2020 given whatever is the global crisis and indian economy's crisis right now it hovers around 82 so we are saying that in something like 25 odd years uh the dollar uh, actually the rupee has fallen by something like uh, i mean you know less than a half so from 31 it has become 82 just keep this uh, perspective in mind uh, whenever so hopefully you will be able to make some sense of these numbers so you see what has happened is uh, actually the kind of uh, everywhere the phone calls have come become cheap but uh, you know i mean if you really look at the numbers we are saying india is by far one of the cheapest uh, phones i mean mobile phones service anywhere in the world and as you can see in 1994 when uh, you know so remember that before 91 economic reforms or opening up of indian economy uh, uh, telecom was a public i mean a government service it was completely in the hand of government nine after 91 economic reforms it starts getting opened up 94 95 it starts and when it starts we are saying the call charges were rupees 18 a minute almost half a more than half a dollar a phone was cost 40000 rupees and from there we are saying by 2020 4g phones cost 500 rupees so that means um, hardly we are saying uh, uh, something like 6 6 and a half dollars and the service was perhaps one of the cheapest if i think it was one the cheapest in the world at some point you will see why all this has happened as i talk mobile density has increased from 4% in 2001 to almost so as literally the there is a phone almost in every hand there though in these numbers these are gross numbers there is lot of uh, you know <laughs> reality which is hidden in these but let me start with these numbers um so i'm also going to use these words um, uh, kind of interchangeably big business monopoly capital big capital so bear with me it is in some kind of uh, you know we are talking about it so what i'm going to do is i'll divide this talk into perhaps three part or four parts first part i'll talk a bit about so what what really big business did here when monopoly capital did here uh, you know and how do we understand what happened here in 2 and 2 to 2 and a half decades when we look at the big capital uh and uh, second part i am going to talk about is that okay what has been the role of state though state will keep coming in in between all the time but so i'll more focus on state in the second part third part is i'll try to make a some overall comments and then conclude with couple of even further larger comments then how do we you know place this whole thing in the present geopolitics uh, and and etc and how do we look at india's monopoly capital so i'll try to generalize so these four parts the first thing is very very striking thing when you start and remember when we are talking about 1990s india or so remember that already you know india has several several big business houses mostly family run business houses many many of them will go back to you know pre 1947 when uh, britishers left india and uh, so some of you would have heard about these big business houses in india also so what happens is as soon as uh, cellular services are opened for uh, for uh, the private capital what happens is very quickly i mean it op gets opened in mid 90s india was divided into to just to give you an idea india is a large large country remember in terms of population so it was divided into 22 different what they called as circles and every circle they said uh, it will there will be two licenses remember uh, telecom all said and done it's like a natural monopoly it's like railroads in some ways or it's like a power sector you are saying competition does not mean anything in this kind of a sector so they divided into 22 circles they said that two licenses each license means remember that there is no meaning of license without spectrum it's like an airlines industry in that sense and uh, spectrum was bundled with the licenses what happens is very quickly you will see this almost like a and there has been two such waves of almost literally like gold rush here all the big actors in india and even from abroad like hindujas is an indian origin group but this is one of the wealthiest uh, uk based business group so many many of them in quick succession in in middle second half of 1990s entered here 
and I started looking at it, you know, that what really is happening. I tried to create certain databases of it because what happened is that, you know, no sooner than these uh, multiple actors, remember there was theoretically, there can be 44 actors, 22 multiplied by two. They act, they enter, achha, remember one more thing. It's an important thing that it was very clear that India did not have any, any kind of private sector telecom company before that. So all these business houses had no, expertise in running a telecom a service. So it was made imperative that each one of them will have a uh, international collaboration. So what also happens uh, immediately is that, you know, you name an international player, they are all in India with their Indian collaborators. So at this time, it was that that majority stake uh, has to be Indian and at the most 49% stake can be held by these foreign companies. So starting with AT and AT and T's to you know France Telecom NTT. I mean you name a company and you are saying perhaps only two continents. I have not seen Latin America and Africa. Uh, rest all the all the you know uh, continents and international uh, big players were in India. The interesting thing is now we are saying and I'll come to that so very quickly to give not not to have it as a suspense. Only two players really speaking are left out of these. One Indian player out of all these players who entered uh, called uh, Airtel. I'll talk a little about it. It's an Indian company. And amongst the international player, only player which has been left back in India is Vodafone. Uh, Vodafone, remember, this is one of the largest uh, international telecom company. And it's a, it's a British company, remember. <clears throat> Though again, they will be have operations in hundreds of companies, but I'm saying British in the terms of their, their headquarters and origins. So these are the two left. And this itself is an interesting thing that what is happening here. And my first thing is what really is happening if you look at it. Indian for in all these Indian big players, big players in the sense they have stakes, they have stakes and they have presence in several sectors in Indian industry. These are all family-based uh, big business houses. What they do is, if you really look at it, if you start looking at it from the benefit of hindsight, now, which is what I'm doing, I'm looking at it in the last few years, then uh, what is happening is they each seem to be entering here, but they seem to be in, in the business of making very quick money. And if you really look at the motivation, I would today put it as that basically they are into either as a middleman, they are saying that, okay, they understand Indian market, they understand Indian Indian state, so they can uh, kind of, uh, you know, work as a some kind of an intermediary middleman, whatever word you want to use it, and a speculator. That you get a license, you sit on it, and then you speculate on it, like any kind of, you know, monopoly that you want uh, rent or you want, you know, some kind of a speculative price on it. And immediately this pattern, this is one large pattern. I have written uh, one long and one shorter piece on this recently. So, I mean, some of you, I'll, I'll skip some of the details. I'm afraid because of the shortage of time right now, but this is what happens here. That uh, they move in, they say that license fee is too high immediately. First, each one of them want to get a license. Immediately they complain, they won't be able to pay the state their dues and Immediately, uh, there is clamor also for saying that state should support or, uh, you know, whatever, give them concessions. Otherwise, this critical strategic se sector will pass into the hand of foreigners. The usual stuff, all this happens and they get a lot of uh, concessions from the government also. Just to give you one example, I have in my writing, I have several, several such examples and small cases. Uh, that's how I have built up this story. For example, look at this, uh, this Hach Vampoha deal. Now, Hutchison Wampoha, remember, this is one of the uh, largest uh, UK, uh, sorry, Hong Kong based from UK time in Hong Kong. So this is one of the largest Hong Kong, Hong Kong based uh, conglomerates. And uh, it comes in uh, with a max, what is what is called, becomes Hutchmax Telecom. And they have, uh, you know, they get the license from one of the wealthiest uh, parts of India, that is Mumbai, the financial capital of India. And um, Interesting thing is just to give you a flavor of what really is happening. Now, Max is otherwise into, they have hospitals. They have, you know, they are into, uh, you know, pharmaceutical, they are into hospital. And suddenly when the license are, uh, are become available, Max moves into telecom. It gets a collaboration with Hachwampoa. And interesting thing is this time, remember, we are saying that Hachwampoa cannot have more than 49% stake because they are a foreign player. Now, what happens is there is a company called Hach Max in which, Hachwampoha gets 49% stake. So this is very much as per the law. But now what happens is that Hachmax is 
uh, there is a holding company. So this is what happens, you know, I mean, when if you get into corporate sector in India or US anywhere, that you are saying there is this layers and layers of stake and it's the whole idea of any kind of regulation becomes very, very hard you know, really to look at it. Exactly this is what happens here. There is a holding company called Telecom Investment India. And uh, where then, uh, you know, Hutchmax from here, 40% holding it has on in, uh, in, you know, this company has 40% holding in Hutchmax. And here, 49% is held by Hutch Wampoha. So finally, you see, if you really look at it, Hutchinson Wampoha has 69% stake when all it is allowed is 49% stake because 40 multiplied by 49 plus 49, it comes to 68.6%. .6%. So we can get later, but basic thing is that you are saying this kind of a pyramid scheme, if one may call it, and then you are saying regulations don't mean anything. And it happens sector after sector, I mean, company after company, circle after circle in this telecom industry. I have several examples to quote here. And you see the, the point that I wanted to come to, Max India, which is the Indian company here, all they have is just, uh, you know, 11 odd percent stake in the whole thing. And perhaps that also they haven't put any money, you know, uh, the, the Kotak Mahindra is a financial company. So some money here, some money by Hach Poha. They have really cornered a license and not put any stake. Obviously, they are in the business of not really building up. Telecom is a very, very, very tough business to build up. It's capital intensive, it's technology intensive, it's service intensive. And so, you know, and these, so this is the story which happens in 1990s in India. I mean, see, I'm quoting here a chief of a, uh, one of the cellular companies, it's it's available in public domain. It says all the stops that the industry is asking for is to improve the selling price and fatten the operating for profit. So basically they're in the business of course. So this is now one kind of a motivation I could find when such large number of so many big houses and with international collaborators are entering. And then they are very quickly within a couple of years, they start exiting from this. This is one kind of a thing. Large number, as you can see, large, large number here all sorts of things. This story itself, I can tell for 45, 50 minutes and that will even that would not be enough. So just give you a flavor. This is one kind of a thing which happens. Second kind of thing, which as I said, is the big, big story here is Spectrum because Spectrum is so coveted and without that, there is no telecom business. So what happens is sometime around 2005, before that, as I said, uh, from middle of 90s, the, the Spectrum was bundled with the license. Now, within a decade or so after the telecom is opened up, the spectrum is unbundled from, so a spectrum can be whatever can be given uh, by the state or it can be auctioned by the state. And here itself, again, another one hour we can talk and even that when we offend what happens here. But one, another kind of a thing which happens here is that people are in the business of cornering spectrum first thing and then be able to speculate and make money out of it. Again, no telecom business can be built like this. And this was perhaps the most egregious example of this is something unprecedented even in Indian history to the extent and I have, I uh, follow India's big capital, but still I can say. So what what is called as that so-called 2008 2G scam. So this is basically 2G spectrum for the next whatever is being sold. And according to Comptroller of Auditor General of India, something like there was a loss to the exchequer to the tune of 1.76 trillion dollar in 2001 and remember this means we are talking about uh, perhaps 20 odd billion dollars so this is big money 1.6 sorry 76 trillion rupees and maybe around 20 odd billion dollars just do your maths uh, this time we are saying that rupee was something like uh, 45 so this is huge money uh, sorry in 2008 2008 it was around 60 rupees so what happens is the market has expanded so much they have actually, one, they sell the at the price of 2001, the spectrum. Two is that they actually do not uh, do any auction. They give it on what they call as FCFS. FCFS stands for first come, first serve. And first come, first serve means that you are saying you can play favorites to any kind of. This is a huge thing. Books have been written on it. You know, reams have been written on it. So what happens according to actually later on, people figured out that out of 122 licenses given, you know, 122, you know, these uh, bundles of spectrums given. 85, uh, Raj, you want to say something? Yeah, just clarifying question. The spectrum, as I understand, is is the broadcast uh, 
a spectrum of wavelength that just like a radio yeah. Yeah. Yeah, is yeah, that absolutely. correct so you okay. are saying something kind of uh, you know yes which which kind of wavelengths will be available and out of which also what kind of how much of band you will be given that's what and this is rationed by the government remember because we are saying that uh, defense services work on it and in india historically we are saying that most of the spectrum has been held by defense services historically and they are very very kg about giving it to the state for telecom services and so on though these stories have been changing i'm going back to 10 15 years back what really was happening or 20 years back what was happening can i go ahead raj yes all right so we are saying 122 license is given out of that 85 were to parties which are actually not eligible and this is again a long story lot of uh, richard you want to say something Richard, you are not audible. I think you're, 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 are you muted? Unmute him, uh, Alan, Richard Wright, so he can ask a clarifying question. Richard, you are saying something? Yeah, he's... No, okay. Yeah, just to, just to clarify, uh, to follow up on Raj's question here, uh, I think I understand what you're talking about, but uh, I just want to. So when you say that uh, a spectrum, a two gigahertz spectrum, uh, do they divide that two gigahertz? So from two to say three gigahertz, they yeah. divide it into a thousand or bundles of ten. I don't know how they how they divide it up. Yes, and that that's what you're talking about. So you you have like what a hundred a hundred bundles? Absolutely, and that's the thing you are saying and then different circles because remember 22 circles india is divided into so when you say 122 licenses these are across these 22 circles so mm -hmm. each, each circle is a geographical area you know uh, you know india as i said large populous country so depending upon the population density and the kind of prosperity in different areas india has been divided into these 22 so each this thing you are correct that you are saying a particular wavelength and within it you know these bundles and then they are being licensed, uh, you know, either on, you know, this kind of way they have been given away. But after this 2008, this became a massive story. Perhaps this led to the downfall of the previous regime. And now we are saying by and large, it is auctioned, whatever that means. The auction has become meaningless because you are saying there are now so few players that and I'll talk about it as we go further. Can I go ahead, Richard? Yeah. Okay. So just to give you one example out of this, I can't talk about all this. So, you know, there what various kinds of things. There were companies which were not eligible. A lot of these are real estate companies. So it's very interesting, like Spectrum is being, perhaps real estate companies have the, you know, real expertise in, you know, dealing with real estate. And now they, they want to expand their expertise and use it for the Spectrum. So Unitech is second largest um, real estate company in India. Big, big player there. And so they end up actually buying licenses in all the 22 circles. And so they buy it for 230 odd million dollars. And Telenor, remember, Telenor is the Norwegian public company, telecom company. This is the dominant company in Norway. And 60% of this stake, they sell it off for 870. So you see it within no time. So you see what kind of money is being made here. 60% of 230 is now being sold for 870. So very quick money. Just give you one example. There are several examples here. All right. And this led to an absolute kind of an irrationality because some circles then had 12 companies, 12 players. Once, this li once the dust around these licenses settled. Now you see this, as I said, is a natural monopoly, a very, very capital intensive business. And it is very difficult for 12. And India is a very poor country all said and done in spite of large population. Where is the buying power for whatever these services? Anyway, what happens is after all this noise, four years, this case, this case is, goes to Supreme Court of India. Supreme Court in its uh, whatever wisdom in 2012 cancels all this 122 licenses and it made a massive damage to a whole lot of investments which many of these companies had made all of that goes down so this is the kind of a messy thing which happens around the you know this game of cornering business and trying to uh, make quick money so you see remember that some people are making huge money here and of course that some people are losing money also both international players and indian players uh, so but 
even better example i'll give you reliance geo now this is geo is today the dominant player as far as telecom is concerned in in india and uh, uh, geo is that the telecom company and reliance is the business house reliance is the biggest business house in india it's uh, you know uh, uh, the 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 head of this company today is the richest person in asia i think reliance uh, should have something like uh, 850 rupees 850 trillion dollars of turnover this year they are big players and their major thing is that they have an oil monopoly in india oil and petrochemicals monopoly they are into many many they have stakes in many 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 sectors but that's one place so now what happens is here, now look at this story. There is a small company called IBSPL. It's called Infotel, Infotel Broadband Service Services Private Limited. You know, it's a small company. As you can see, its turnover is so small. You know, its, it's turnover is hardly one and a half million. It's look at, look at, it's this thing. But what happens is when the next time auction is done in 2011, IBSPL and IBSPL was not into telecom. It was into primarily into internet services, not primarily only into tele, uh, internet services. So it's not even noticed by the other telecom players because for internet also, of course, you need spectrum. So they end up buying very silently when the, when the spectrum was uh, being auctioned and they buy it worth 128 billion rupees, some 500,000 times of their net worth. And you can see, of course, that they are being backed by somebody. They don't have this kind of means. I mean, all kinds of further, uh, you know, facts people brought in here. I'm not getting into when we have time, we can get into. Now, interesting thing is, so IBSPL won, wins bids in all 22 telecom cir uh, circles for Spectrum. 5,000 times their net worth, way beyond their means. And this is not the first time this is happening. I'm just giving you a few examples. Same day, they call an extraordinary general meeting. They raise their authorized capital by, uh, you know, from 30 million to 6 billion, issue 75% of shares to this Reliance Group. Remember, at this time, there is no Reliance Geo. There is only Reliance, you know, the parent company. Geo comes later. I'll talk about it. Um, within a week, they become from a private limited company, they become a, they, they become a public limited company. And in 2013, and then this company is this company is renamed as Reliance Geo Infocom Limited. At some point of time, uh, you know, in 2011, actually, you know, you if you get a license for internet, you can't even offer voice or you know data services. Internet, I mean, you can of course do data services. So internet means you can do only internet. You can't do voice on it. Now these regulations are also changed sometime around 2013, 14, and I'm going to, uh, so this happens. And uh, I'll talk a bit more about Reliance Geo a little later, but all I'm giving you a bit about that, what, how speculum is, is, is this uh, spectrum is another thing on which so much of, uh, you know, speculation has happened in India. Uh, second thing I want to talk about. So this is one kind of a thing that so much of speculations and so much of quick money being made. What all second thing I'm going to talk that finally all this, if you look at a decade down, you know, and especially two decades down now when we are sitting here that you are saying that finally what we are left actually in India, we are saying almost we are at the verge of becoming a duopoly as far as the vast telecom sector is concerned. Just look at look at the trajectory of two important players here. This is what is what started as Birla with a collaboration with Birla, remember, is one of the largest traditionally Indian big business houses. And uh, this is when the family split. So in between that, the Aditya Birla group, which is the largest Birla group, the family split into a couple of pieces and at and the US telecom company. So this started with their merger, uh, their, their this thing collaboration. And very quickly, you are saying large business houses like Tata's, RPG, BPL, they merge and later on they actually walk out. So they all this is, it starts at some point of time, they change their, um, you know, brand to something called Idea. Idea becomes one of the largest telecom brands in India, you know, after this. Uh, at and uh, you know, uh, move, uh, uh, leaves in 2004, Tata's leave in 2006. Uh, many other big players like Spicer bought by them, 
and then you see this merger happened between Vodafone and Idea. And this was supposedly the largest uh, merger in telecom sector anywhere in the world. They were number two and number three at that time in India. Jio by this time had become the largest uh, telecom company in India. And they had something like 390 million subscribers at this time. And still, they were into massive losses. I'll come to you, this, that why they were in massive losses. You can see that 440 billion rupees losses in one year, 1.33 trillion rupees losses over three years. So you can see this is serious problem, but they became largest company. Now they are at the number three. I'll talk a little more. Now this company is called Voda Idea. You started with Birla and Vodafone, they merged together. And now this company is called Voda Idea, you know, or Vodafone Idea. It's called Voda Idea actually. So this, even the other, other big company in India, Airtel, if you see, so this is one of the consistent players. It came in the 1990s. They had, again, no presence in telecom. Telecom, nobody, no private sector had. They were making some push-button phones, if you go back to the 1990s, small company. And from there, they enter uh, telecom. And you can see over the years, so 2008 crisis happens, then they buy companies, 1990s crisis, they buy four or five companies, six companies. So four companies, two companies here. So you can see 10 companies. They also have either merged or bought or some companies have given their whatever assets to them and moved out. So again, you can see what kind of a consolidation is happening here in a very quick kind of a space, you know, a very, very, very short period and in cer at certain junctures. And very rapidly, what we are left with is very, very, very large monopolies in, in, in this sector. So just to give, this is what second thing I wanted to say. Third thing I wanted to say this, what really is happening here is this whole thing of, you know, uh, predatory uh, pricing. I'll give you only one example here, but this is not the only example. There are several many, very, very interesting examples, but let me talk about the largest player and a very, very unusual, uh, you know, strategy for them to enter. So remember, as I said, this is Reliance Geo. Reliance Geo is Reliance is the largest business house in India. Geo today is the largest telecom company in India. Now Reliance Geo was, you know, you have, they have entered very late in this sector. So 1990s the sector gets open. Reliance enters in 2016. I mean, they buy from that back door the the Spectrum in 2011. Then they build their whole investment. Apparently they have invested 20 25 billion dollars and made this massive countrywide network, as you can see some numbers there in the on my first point here. And uh, there are reasons also why Reliance was so late to enter, but if there is time, I'll come back to it in the, in the discussion. Uh, I'm not getting into it. There are so many stories into stories here. The interesting thing is when they enter it, they say we are starting, we are testing our network. And they said they will give free SIMs to employees, employees, friends, family, they start with this kind of free test trials. All right. And remember, India is a poor country. This happens even in, may happen in a rich country also. Free means, you know, people are just standing in the queue. I'm told I, outside our institute, people will get up at 4 a.m. in the morning and stand in the queue to get these free sims. So they claim that they are giving it to employees, friends, and family to begin with. By August, they claim that they have already 2.53 million users without any kind of commercial operations. They launch their commercial operations in September. Once they launch it, they say, now we have a welcome offer. All this is free, free meaning absolutely free, zero money. So they say three months welcome offer. Then December comes, they say happy new year offer, three more months. And you see the their competitors are trying crying horse. They are saying this is predatory and all of us will be decimated. The Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, that is the omnibus uh, regulatory authority in India, uh, you know, of telecom sector. They given <laughs> given the kind of muscle which houses like Reliance have, they pass the buck. Finally, they ask the Attorney General of India, uh, you know, Rotagi to opine on it. Rotaki also does not really opine. He says promotional offers are not subject to regulatory principles of whatever, whatever, basically saying that they can continue whatever they are doing. He has nothing to say about it. 
February, as you can see, um, you know, now you have already this massive kind of subscription they have built up, you know, in no time as you can, because they have launched only in September. Remember that. Telecom secretary, interestingly, somebody called J.S. Deepak, he's the Department of Telecoms, uh, you know, the, the highest official. He raises concern because he's saying, one, if they keep giving this kind of free and others also lose market in this way, other competitors, massive revenue loss for the government. And remember, in India, financial sector is dominated by public sector banks, government banks. And government, uh, I'll give you data in one of the further slides, may have around... Uh, you know, something like 8 trillion rupees worth of, uh, you know, uh, loans or whatever uh, money of government, which is stuck in the telecom sector. So government has, uh, you know, major things to worry about here. But as soon as he raises, I think he raises this issue in a note on, on a Friday, by Monday, it reaches the prime minister's office. I think same day, <laughs> within, within the day is over, he's transferred from the department. And uh, it continues. Now they say, you know, Happy New Year, and then there is a summer surprise. They say that, you know, so the summer surprise is that it will continue till July. Remember, it started in May 2016. So we are already into 15, 16. So they said three more months. And from July, you start paying some money. That is the time, first time the tele Telecom Regulatory Authority of India says that, okay, they advise Geo to kind of withdraw. And, uh, you know, at that time, a note was circulated by additional secretary there in the, in the department, which says, which justifies it, says that because they're giving it free, it's the income in the hand of consumers. And this is not the first time again, again and again, even the earlier uh, 2G scam, the, that time telecom minister said, no, no, we are, we, if we are uh, giving uh, the spectrum free, that means people are getting uh, telecom at the cheaper rate. So this kind of thing continues again and again. Uh, so this is one kind of a thing. You look at it, what is happening, what, what the business is doing here. So I'll leave this part here. Now, second thing I want to talk about here is that, look, the whole thing has been again and again, repeatedly, when it comes to government regulations and government dues, again and again, we are saying that they have been ignored, not followed, all kinds of corners have been cut. You know, that's the story. For example, so let me tell you a couple of them. Now, AGR dues. AGR stands for Adjusted Gross Revenue. So what happens is, remember, when it began in 1990s, the first licenses, there was a license fee, annual license fee was supposed to be pay, pay by, paid by each operator. Now, at some point of time, operators, you remember in 1990s, still they started crying hoarse that this is too much of money to pay and we are not able to make any money, et cetera, et cetera. So government said, okay, instead of having a fixed license free fee, let's have a, you know, a percentage of your gross revenue. What they called and why they called adjusted gross revenue, I'll come to that. To begin it was 15%. They said 15% is too much. It came to 12% and now it is 8%. All right. So all this is part of this, this story. Uh, and uh, now the government said all your dues, including your, you know, you get some interest on some investments, et cetera. Everything should be your gross revenue, not only revenue from your telecom service. And the whole idea was that so that you are not able to kind of dress your books and be able to pass revenue from one, one service to another and so on and so forth. And that's why the government said adjusted gross, what they called as adjusted immediately so it's not that once it moves to and they all signed this new contracts remember all the telecom service providers but immediately they went to one dispute settlement body to courts to high court to supreme court tdsat stands for telecom dispute settlement authority etc and authority and tribunal etc so they went one after another so from 1990s the dues are still to be cleared when i and you are talking about it the original amount was whatever, you know, and now we are saying rupees 230 million. And now this has really ballooned into massive money. It's it's now a couple of, uh, you know, one uh, trillion dollars, uh, sorry, trillion rupees. Whenever I'm saying I'm meaning rupee, I'm not meaning dollar, dollar I'm not talking about. And, you know, most of it has still not been paid. So, and even, you know, further, I'm not going to talk about is, you know, there is this whole issue that now the companies which have folded, 
Now, what happens to their unpaid dues? Who is going to pay for them? And you see, remember also what happens is none of these companies, I mean, see, if you have unpaid dues, the simple accounting practice is that you make provisions for it in your books. None of them have made any, any of this thing. So their profits look better. Their books look healthier. So a lot of, uh, you know, money to be made in stock market there. And I'll come to that part a little later. All this is the story behind what I'm talking about here. So there are big players and you are saying their unpaid dues, for example, $250 billion of a company called Arcom, not going to talk about it because of air sale 124, who pays for it? And the interesting thing is Arcom and air sales spectrum is now being used by Geo and Airtel, the two largest companies. So Geo Airtel said they are not, you know, uh, you know, responsible for unpaid dues of spectrum dues of our common air cell. They are using the spectrum. Our common air cells are now into, you know, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, winding up proceedings. And so who are you going to catch? It continues like this. A lot of finer points here, but I'm not getting in, in Indian Supreme Court even refuses to give a judgment on this that who is going to, I mean, nobody knows how do you settle this thing. So this gives you a flavor of what really is happening here. And you see, I will not get into it, but you see that why adjusted gross revenue, again, Comptroller and Auditor General of India, this is India's highest uh, auditing uh, you know, body, it's a constitutional body. And they have actually said that these people have kind of uh, cooked up their books and those books are signed by the world's largest uh, you know, auditors, corporate auditors, uh, whatever, the big, big three, big four, whatever. And actually they have, you know, a lot of evidence they have put, uh, there has been two reports at least of CAG that I could find. And again, so, so it's the government's concern was genuine. Uh, you will see a lot of popular media will make it out as if this is all, you know, government's paranoia or whatever and corporate sector, but you can see it's happening. I'll not get into these details because of uh... another thing as I have already shown you. So you see FDI limit, foreign direct investment limit. And I said that to begin with, it was 49%. This itself is interesting that 49, why 49 is done to 74 in 2005 and in 2014 with the new NDA government, the present government, it has been opened up 100%. But way, much, much before this, these, as I have shown you earlier also in Hutch Bampoha case, all these rules were only being, you know, only norm was that you can break them with impunity, nobody is going to catch you. And anyway, once you are saying companies can be bought and sold, merged and this thing, licenses can be sold, spectrum can be sold, you know, and this what puree of, uh, you know, that how will you make us say that, okay, you know, this particular spectrum or license is only for this service, this technology, this circle, etc. Because you see, there has been such massive changes in technology and telecom sector and so much of convergence. So all this becomes meaningless and, uh, you know, government has just not been able to make any kind of, you know, uh, regulations work when it comes to all this. So very quickly, this part, I'll not talk about it, but just again, give you the example. Now this, uh, you know, for example, Reliance. Now you see, again, this is Reliance Geo and that's why let me just talk in a minute. So what have they done? So remember, 2016 to 17, they kept giving you free SIMs. 2017, they started charging some minor money. And 2000, early 18, I think, by that was the fourth quarter of 2017, 18 years, if I remember correctly. They say we are making money, we are making profits. And basically, as uh, Bernstein, again, a brokerage firm, it, it pointed out more than once, they have, you know, on depreciation, they have not followed any international or even national norms to, norms to some ex that extent. While we are saying, and remember capital, it's a very, very capital intensive industry. So generally the norm in telecom is 8, 8.5% depreciation. They charge 2, 2% 2 JEP. Of course, their books will look healthy. For example, they gave free mobile handsets to people as part of their promotion. Now this free mobile, of course, they would have paid money to buy those handsets. They did not, you know, book it into Reliance Geo. They booked it to their sister company called Reliance Retail. So they booked it somewhere else. And once you start getting into it, you can see that they want certain kind of, uh, you know, jack up in their prices of their stock markets, etc. And so they are doing it. 
Uh, this was, uh, you know, another company. I mean, we have time. We'll come back to it. Otherwise, I mean, Veritas. This is a very, very revealing report. Not only about a company called Arcom. Uh, at that time, it was the third largest telecom company. But also that how, what kind of accounting practices and how egregious or how problematic are these practices and very, very little accountability. This is all of 30, 40 page report. It's a very revealing report of the kind of accounting practices. So you see one kind of a thing I'm saying is that, see, market is not going to work here because it's all monopoly. Government regulations are not working here because you can see what is happening to state regulations. Third thing is you're saying, at least as a citizen, I may like to look at the books, but you are saying books are in, in such, such problematic ways they are being managed. So, so you are saying that also, and this is one kind of a difficulty also for a researcher, for somebody who's trying to study to be able to make sense. So you say you will only look at the numbers, you will only look at the books, you're not going to really find what, what is happening here. Anyway, I'll, so these are, these are the kind of two, three points that I have made. Let me try to make some general points from here. Now, one kind of a thing you can see here is this whole system finally is left with, now we are saying, really speaking, two players, Airtel and Geo, a vast Indian market, one and a half billion people. And then you are saying Voda idea, Voda idea I'll already show you what has happened to it. Remember, which I have not talked about before 91, there was, uh, or before 94, there was a public sector company. Which, which was earlier something else, but at some point it became what is called as BSNL. Now, BSNL from being the predominant company, you are saying its market share has come to less than 10%. And one reason is because you are saying now uh, after 3G in 4G and 5G, neither government has let given its spectrum nor a, you know, kind of in such a capital intensive and competitive sector, you are saying neither it has injected any equity or money so, you know, of course, BSNL is bleeding, you know, and this is a story of sector after sector of public sectors in India. It is not something that uh, uh, this thing is. I'll talk a bit about BSNL if I get a minute or two. Uh, can I take around 10 to 15 minutes more, Raj? Yeah, if you can do it in 10 minutes, that'll be good ah, because minutes, I have a question and answer. But if you need 15, we'll hey, go 10 ahead. minutes, I'll try. Okay. All right. And what this has become really is what Schumpeter calls as a co-respective system. Now, so now they are, they, now they are, they are into live and let, let live kind of a thing. So you can see in so many ways, companies like Geo and Airtel are kind of, uh, you know, also into, you know, kind of uh, into certain kind of informal arrangements. You will see one will in increase the price. Another will increase the price. You will also see news items which say that actually top excellence of the government are nudging them to whatever. So after that 2016 to 18 mayhem, now they are into certain kind of an understanding now that only two, two and a half players are left in India. And, you know, this whole sector, they are saying, you are saying that they hold it for ransom now. And um, Vodafone, if I talk quickly here, saying their debt has ballooned to $2 trillion because they have simply not paid government dues. Primarily, it is government dues. And now, if you look at the popular media, they will shout that Are, uh, there is going to be now monopoly in this sector and only two players will be left. So finally, what has happened is while the government is not investing any money in BSNL, its own company, it finally ends up buying 36% stake in lieu of its, uh, you know, whatever its unpaid dues. So now, Vodafone, ironically, the government is the largest stakeholder. So you see, it's a completely a system which way you can't make sense of if you look at it from outside till you get into these details. And also at this point of time, remember telecom is such a basic service today, but you are saying all government is left with if they, it wants to implement any policy, it has to go to Reliance, Geo or Airtel or both to get its policies implemented, they can hold it to ransom. Some details here, I'll uh, skip this. Second, you uh, see overall- Rahul, one, one interruption. You, yeah. meant, uh, you meant to say the, that uh, uh, that was 2 trillion rupees, not $2 trillion. Yeah. 2 trillion rupees, sorry. No. Do dollar, I'm by and large not talking. So even if I say somehow one is programmed to think about trillion and dollar, so that's why. So, but just, just uh, you know, process that. Uh, second thing is that, uh, you know, this whole large sector 
in perpetually, if you look at it, it is in certain kind of, if you look at it from the dis discourse of the business press, especially it is in as if it is in crisis. So perhaps ARPU is the best uh, indicator of this. ARPU is the uh, basically average revenue per user. This is the metric which is used across the world to understand the what is happening in the telecom sector. And you can see how drastically ARPU has come down. And these are nominal numbers, remember. From being healthy 350 per month, we are saying it has come down to 70. And these are nominal numbers. In actual terms, if you deflate them, then the, 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 the and it is reflecting here. So what is happening is, uh, you know, it is reflecting in that this, like, they are continuously, these are people are complaining that they are not making money and they will say government is fleecing them. All right. The, the captains of this industry, Sunil Mittal, the one I'm quoting here is he's the, he's the, uh, is the boss of uh, Bharti Airtel. Airtel. Uh, he says that, see, our government is uh, so much of levy, 35% goes towards state levy. They will say that so much is going into capital expenditure. But the point is that when is not if one is not they are not they are not telling you that denominator itself is so low. If you have cut prices, if you are into predatory pricing, you are not making revenues. Then obviously it will look like that lot of your money is going to state as revenue or into further capital expenditure, etc. But the primary problem here is that each one of them or many of them are into predatory pricing, cutting each other and trying to get a monopoly hold over the industry. And given that this industry, the technology is changing rapidly and uh, there are massive capital expenditures involved, you know, this is uh, a mess. And the worst who are going to suffer is that, see, their, their dues, for example, just the public sector banks uh, mostly public sector, what's it, to the tune of 8 trillion rupees. And mostly of people's savings of common folks, because that is what goes into uh, public sector banks, remember. So this is this is one kind. Of, and a lot of these, uh, then money is not going to come back as these people fold up and go. So <clears throat> here I'll not get into this, but you can see obviously with so many companies are closing shops, massive, you know, in a very, very capital scarce country like India, Massive one capital losses. These are numbers. Mittal himself, again, the owner of air, he says 40, 40 50 billion dollars have just gone uh, since the geo has entered the picture, etc. So, yeah, this is big money. All this is big money, what I put here for anywhere, for any economy, and definitely for India. Also, in an you know, in a country where uh, employment is so difficult to come by especially in uh, corporate sector, you are saying massive job losses. Now, interestingly, if you look at the press, they will only talk about people who get employment. And when these numbers, are, there are no consolidated figures. These, these uh, sectors are, these new sectors are not organized at all. There's not even a suggestion of any kind of organizing. And these are supposedly white collar workers or white collar employees who also think union is beneath them, et cetera. So there is no unionization. Massive job losses also here, which no record. So you see, all this is part of this so-called uh, success story. Third, I think uh, a related point is that with all these cheap prices, this finally, which nobody talks about, the service quality is fairly poor. Some some statistic here. Now these are international statistics, so you can see in terms of internet speed or India's ranking in terms of uh, download speed, etc. And uh, you know here. The reality looks very different from saying that everybody has a phone and a cheap phone. Uh, and uh, for example, again, uh, these companies, while uh, they are into consolidating, while they are into building brands, investing in that, investing in marketing, they are not investing in infrastructure. Again, this is a very, very infrastructure intensive sector. And so again, if you look at fiberization of uh, you know Indian network, that is uh, very, very far from what it should be and very far from the targets that government had set up or the policymakers had set up. So again, some numbers here, I won't um, get into it. This point, I'll talk a little. So it's, but the point remains, it's not that uh, money is not being made. As I said, you know, see, this is a very capital intensive sector. Telecom service is a commodity. You can't differentiate between, hardly differentiate between two tele kinds of telecom, two different competitors giving you a telecom service. And so it becomes that uh, predatory pricing becomes one way to be able to 
get market share because you have invested so much of money. That's the logic of this kind of a massive, uh, you know, sized monopoly capital. It can't work any other way. But we must not think that people are not, the bosses are not making money. This will give you one example. For example, look at Airtel. Their stock prices have gone from rupees 12 in 2002 to 7, 16, 20 years. And uh, its promoter is a first generation entrepreneur. And now Sunil Mittal is one of the richest, uh, I think in he figures in, uh, he's a billionaire, of course, and he figure, big, uh, figures in the some of the richest people in the world, etc. Uh, his worth is, I think this year when I, or the last year I looked at, it was $15 billion. And whole lot of uh, kind of, if we had time, I talked about Veritas report earlier, now even if the CAG, lot of ways in which just by, opening front companies, transferring shares on paper from here to there, a lot of wealth acquisition can, can be done. For example, this CAG report 2015 on Airtel again, rupees 440 40 billion created by corporate restructuring and transferring assets in a four-year period. Uh, this, is, this is not an exception. This has happened again and again and again. You know, So that's the point. Again, I'll not go into that. It's astounding. These were the worst months of, uh, you know, the lockdown in India during COVID. And in space of few months, so what Reliance did, so Geo Telecom is their telecom company. This, over that, they, they, start, they brought in a holding company called Geo Platforms and the parent is Reliance Industries Limited. Now, Geo Platform, it quickly was able to sell within space of months worth something like 1.1 trillion rupees to some of the largest and their valuation is astounding 165 times of their earnings which is extraordinary generally it is 10 odd percent uh, 10 odd times 165 times and who were the buyers facebook now meta 5.7 billion dollars it bought 10 percent stake google qualcomm kkr mubadala is abu, abu dhabi state investment is saudi arabia's Sovereign fund Microsoft also was in the in the news, but finally that deal didn't happen. And so you know, twenty twenty two billion dollars were made within months, and they sold off. So you see, while at and if you look at the the books, it will look like as if things are, and that's the popular discourse in India that these companies are giving things for free. But if you start looking at somewhere else, uh, so one, where is that free for coming? Free is coming from, as I have already said. But the other thing is, you know, where the money is really being made is through financialization of their assets. So this is another, I'll not get into it, but very quickly, one point is that, that basically we are, see the point is that in spite of all this, I mean, prima facie, a layperson will think that therefore India would be able to build up, you know, a lot of know-how because India is one of the second largest telecom market in the world today. And yet we are saying, forget about network, networking equipment, forget about switching gear. We are saying even, not even smartphone, even feature phone. We are saying that really speaking, some license manufacturing is happening, which is, you know, a lot of time touted as made in India, but there is so much of literature on that right now. Some I have also quoted in my writing, we are saying, we almost make, and I'm not exaggerating it, we almost make nothing of this. India is a you know, manufacturing starved, employment starved country. And in spite of this so-called success, we are saying, uh, you know, we have very, very little to show here, you know, really speaking. I'll just skip these slides, but this is what I'm, I'm trying to say here. And, you know, that's why, you know, so there is right now, for example, as we last year, the 5G network has been started in India by the prime minister with a lot of fanfare and a, a geos, uh, you know, the, the, the proprietor Mukesh Ambani, uh, when he went to White House, uh, he said our 5G network is completely indigenous. India's finance minister goes to US and various places, uh, commerce minister, all of them. But whatever I have been able to examine, we have been saying it's pure bluster. It's just words. There is absolutely no trace of really speaking any, any expertise being developed in India to establish a 5G network. And finally, you know, if you look at these two companies, these are two companies which have gone into 5G right now, Airtel and <clears throat> Geo. Primarily, we are saying these three players because now we have done, we have also 
uh, because of uh, their geopolitics and including pressures from US, we are saying that uh, uh, that uh, the Chinese companies are Huawei and all that is out now. 4G network mostly by, was done in India by Huawei actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, towers, etc. also by the Chinese company. But now we are saying it's Samsung, Ericsson and Nokia all the way. This also means I have given some data in my writing much higher prices because now you are saying as competition goes down, you know, they, are, they have license to increase the prices. So you see, this is where I kind of close, uh, you know, what has happened is India is right now giving massive, uh, if I can say in quote unquote incentives to promote made in India, make in India, to promote, uh, you know, manufacturing in India, massive in the last two, three years. But the point that I'm <laughs> making it and point I would like to make is that we are not willing to learn that what has happened in telecom sector and why. And, uh, you know, just merely giving more incentives because so much of incentives have been given, quote unquote, in the telecom sector already. All right. If we have time later, I'll come to this very interesting story about five, you know, missing I from 5G I. 5G I, just to tell you in one line, is uh, 5G standard and at with much fanfare. Two years back, India said that now India has an indigenous standard 5G I, I standing for India, which has been recognized by international bodies. And when the Indian Prime Minister last year inaugurates 5G in India, I goes missing. And there are reasons for it, reasons related to what I have already said, but uh, right now I'm not going there. So uh, this I have already said, I'm not going to repeat it. So this is kind of a summary of what, you know, uh, what has happened according to me in the telecom sector. All right. And remember, yeah, one thing I should say, it's a very, very strategic sector. Another place where a lot of money is going to be made is because this is going to become the pipeline for media, for retail, for banking, uh, you know, in India, even education and health and a new kind of digital divide. In fact, we are saying that have not will get education and health from their mobile, while only people who have money can get better personalized services. So, whole new kind of development, which because of this cheap telecom are going to happen. And I'm not even talking about surveillance because that is, of course, one major, major thing through this phone in your hand. Uh, <clears throat> see, I want to just conclude here. Just, you know, see, there is so much of hype right now inside India. And I also see even when I look at some whatever little international press, India is fifth largest economy, you know, BRICS is going to take over whatever, you know, then another kind of poll. India is heading G20. Right now, Shanghai Cooperation Organization also India is heading right now. So a lot of this kind of a talk that finally, you know, India is going to have a place at the high table of whatever. And Indian big capital is going to be the, you know, the, that find its place. But the point, only thing I'm arguing through this is that we need to go beyond appearance and examine the reality if we really want to understand what is happening in India. And therefore, you know, when we look at Indian capital and Indian ruling elite, you know, what is internationally, then what really is happening here. I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks. Thanks for listening to me with patience. There are some things in chat, but uh, I have not read them. I'm sorry. Okay. So... If you can uh, uh, end your, uh, your your share screen, and uh, okay, thank you. So thank you, uh, Rahul. Uh, very detailed, rather uh, complex for American audience presentation, but uh, uh, even for me, who's well connected to India, it was difficult because I, I'm not up on all this, but I got the essence of it. And so there will be question and answer where you can clarify things. But before we go there, there will be little intermission. And let me um, let me uh, say what is coming up in the next uh, week or so, next two weeks. Uh, let's see, I have um, here, let's see. Uh, excuse me for... Uh, so next week, <laughs> lost the screen. Um, um, 
Okay, here it is. Okay, I will share this screen. So that's the best way to do it, is to share this screen. What's coming up next week is, uh, uh, can you see it or not yet? I don't think you can see it yet. Not yet. Okay, once one second. Why am I not? Okay, here it is. Okay, uh, share screen. Um, um, okay, share. Okay, uh, now it should work. Okay, what's coming up next week is on uh, the title is Haiti, an anti-imperialist perspective. The speaker is Danny Shaw. It'll be on June 25th, to next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Danny Shaw teaches Latin American and Caribbean studies and race, uh, ethnicity, class, and gender at the City University of New York. So that's next Sunday. Uh, two weeks from now will be um, uh, U.S. imperial policy in Korea. It's Simon Chun from the Korea Policy Institute. And uh, uh, that's actually on July 9th. So June 25th, July 9th. For the 30th, we don't have a speaker as of now. And we will develop something and uh, announce it at the next session. OK, so uh, also, uh, if Richard could place the request for uh, donations to ICSS program committee. We, we do need some money to uh, run these things. Uh, so uh, I think Richard will do that. A any other announcement? Jean, do you have something to say or uh, shall we proceed to the question and answer session? I think we can go to uh, question and answer at this point. Yeah, and I have nothing to say. add. Thank you. Okay. Very comprehensive. Yeah, so how we run the question answer, uh, Rahul, would be uh, people will raise hands and and the questioner or person who's commenting on the presentation will get two minutes. And uh, Alan, please uh, keep track of the time. And mm -hmm. But you, your response mm -hmm. done in, to individual questions will not take more than one question at a time. Is there's no restriction? You can explain and take time as much as you, as you need to. So um, uh, we can get into. And the first questioner right now is Richard Wright. Thank you. Um, let me lower my hand. Um, so, in large measure, what you presented to me uh, presented uh, it to me. Um, uh, was very much how uh, the gamblers of Wall Street are are shuffling pay, pay, shuffling money, and it's fine. basically it's you know, what you presented was very much financial transactions, uh, and and the fraud was really in terms of accounting fraud. Um, I think there's another model out there that that might lo look at. Um, uh, look at the use of, uh, as you put it, a natural monopoly, uh, and that's. Uh, and, and I don't know if it's still going. I haven't, you know, checked on this. But Mintel of France, which uh, really started the first internet, um, decades, you know, before uh, before the quote the internet came around. Um, have you looked at that at all? And and uh, could you look at that and compare also? Uh, I mean, that's more of a regulatory um, uh, approach uh, at, uh, at a re regulating a natural monopoly. Um, and also, how do the Chinese deal with this? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, shall I respond to it? Is that okay? Yes, uh, yes. That's our, that's our yeah. format. Actually, ch Chinese part, because of the, I had not put it here. I actually looked at Huawei. Huawei and telecom sector in China is very, very interesting. And 
def first and foremost for India, because you are saying, see, if you go back to 1990s, uh, when uh, China is opening up their telecom sector exactly at the same time when India is opening up. And if anything, China would be, I would say, behind India's whatever. India had some indigenous capabilities. We were making our own phones on public sector. We had a large network that we had put up in India in, again, by the state sector, you know. And uh, uh, now, so it's very interesting, the kind of uh, one, see, telecom sector, when, when it comes to services, completely now Chinese is in the government hand. And which is true of a very large number of countries in the world, that the telecom service, because it's such a critical service, it's in, it's in the, actually in the state hands, one. Second thing is, if you look at a company like Huawei, and I have written about it, if some of you would have time, I'll be very happy to inflict that on you. Uh, so uh, Huawei, the, the kind of, so they, they were a trading company to begin with, trading which has absolutely nothing to do with telecom in 1990s. It's headed by a Red Army, you know, former engineer. And from there, right now, the, you know, many, many interesting features of Huawei. For example, it's, it's predominantly the shares are uh, held by the employees. It's a, in some ways, and if one may call, I'm simplifying it a little, an employee held company. The kind of investment Huawei has done in R&D. And of course, a very, very critical role of the state there, because you are saying state is willing to, if I may use the arm twist, the foreign companies to part with the technology. Because otherwise we all know that big international capital is not going to part with the technology. That has been their record, not from today. Even if we go back after second world war and you know mm -hmm. decolonization of the third world, et cetera, I mean, that has been their consistent record, but when they are under threat of certain kind. You know, so so Huawei and uh, so Huawei's development is, I can uh, say many things about it, but to, Cut short, Huawei is a very, very interesting example. I can definitely share some writings on Huawei in this. So China is very different the way India has gone with a similar kind of a size, you see, unfortunately. And that's where the political economy, economy becomes very, very important. The way India's political economy is very different from China. So this is one kind of a thing which you said. Uh, the the internet, you, what you said, uh, you know, I I have not looked at. You know, I would be happy, Richard, if you can share so what you suggested. If you can share the reference with me, that will be very nice. And I well, look into. I, I was actually talking about Mintel, which was uh, which was the Ministry of Telecommunications in France, okay. uh, where they where they actually gave people uh, okay. replace replace telephone directories. They gave people a cheap computer, basically. Okay, so just share something on this. I have not uh, followed that at all, the French uh, thing at all. So that will be nice. I'll be happy to look at it. Uh, uh, the uh, the third thing you said in the right in the beginning that you know accounting fraud. But you see, this uh, the one basic difference here is that uh, you know one, you know what has happened, which makes this <laughs> this example very interesting, is that finally you see a cheap service for a change has reached people. So that's one kind of a variation. Second uh, kind of thing here is happening that there is a large physical service involved. I mean, see, telecom service can't happen without massive capital investment in technology, infrastructure, so on and so forth. And also the spectrum, et cetera. So all this also, there is a material basis, there is a physical basis. And on the top of it, of course, they are making money by, as you rightly said, by doing all kinds of accounting and financial jugglery. I agree there with you. So this is how I would see the your first point. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I'm finished. I've said what I have to say. Okay, so our next person in line is Alan Miller. Go ahead, Alan. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, oh, hold on a second. Um, my question is, uh, first of all, I really appreciate your detailed uh, description of the development of the industry. And I think it is really interesting to see how starting from the 90s, just step by step, how it developed, how it spread, the financing, the financial maneuvering, and you you painted a very clear picture of kind of well, frankly, parasitic 
uh, speculative activity in the delivery of a commodity that that's how it came about. And it's kind of shoddy for that matter. So I have a lot of questions to ask you. I'm going to start with a couple of questions. You can take them one at a time. Uh, and I'll, I won't go on and on, Raj, I promise. I'll just ask. Well, a right questions. now we don't, First we don't of all, have a competition. You can take more than two yeah. minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm not timing myself, so that's that's fine. That's okay. That's okay. Um, first of all, something that you said, well, several parts were really interesting. One of them was the um, when American uh, foreign companies moved in and, and the section on finance capital and started drawing money out by uh, investment. Could you say a few words about the scale of that, uh, how, how large it was? Uh, it kind of also ties into the question of, it sounds like the infrastructure was largely imported. Absolutely. And that's also kind of an international trade issue. Um, unlike in, in uh, I assume in China, I think it was probably built up domestically. Can you uh, briefly speak about how the financial involvement drew money out of India, how the trade you know, what was the trade about that actually financed the development of the infrastructure? And then I have other questions after that, but I'll start with that. So, uh, this is a hard question to uh, address, Alan, because there are so many <laughs> threads here, but you see how it is happening. So if you really look at international business or international players, right from, we are saying, you see, this is a like everything, this is also a game, right from the auction of telecom spectrum. So you will see in telecom spectrum, who is involved? Rothschilds are involved because Indian state doesn't have an expertise. So what happens is Rothschilds will, you know, uh, uh, create this kind of a platform on which this auction will happen. So just to give you one example. Now you are saying that if say, for example, Swiss telecom is, or say French telecom is coming to India. Now, so what will also happen with it, with the French telecom is investing in India, that means that French telecom is also going to bring certain, uh, say, you, you know, Ericsson equipment to India. Then you are saying there will be French banks, which will also line up certain kind of, you know, the lines of loans through which this Ericsson equipment will be funded and then it will come to India. So you see, this is a very, very opaque way. And you can see how many things are possible, the kind of overpricing of equipment and kind of thing. And this is a never ending loop. It can continue forever. You can keep buying. That's the game. And you are never going to, you know, this thing. Unlike what you said, since you also mentioned about China, what has happened there is you see, begin with, they were nowhere in this game. But they have very they have put this as a condition given that they have leveraged their large country. And given that finally, as a because service providing was in their hand in the government sector. So they are the ultimate buyers of all that equipment. So they have leveraged all that demand, that large demand, which we have not done in India. You see, that's the problem. Because we have done it. This is India is <laughs> typical, if I make all this is laissez-faire, free for all. You do whatever. And everybody is into making quick money. And now, when I look at it three decades down, this is this is these are the consequences. That large. What was you know, the um, was the international component of money coming money coming out of India in the form of returns on investments by Google and Meta, and also the foreign trade in terms of importing. Was it a very significant part of the Indian international, uh, you know, balance of payment, uh, you know, current account, basically, or is it a uh, small? How much is domestic money coming, getting sucked, sucked up, and how much of it is foreign? See, it's very hard to make up, uh, make out, given these three decades of opaque, you know, functioning. But you see, it there. It's not only international companies. You know, look at this. Hindenburg report, I don't know any of you saw any news news item on Hindenburg on the India's at that time largest business group called Gautam Adani, which is supposed to be very close to the present dispensation in, in, in power. 
and you see the the indian operators themselves have also these uh, you know companies based in tax havens and through which they operate so it's not only international companies that's the modus operandi till you see state is able to make accountable not only international it's not only a question of foreign foreign business that indian business is also a big business monopoly capital is also in the same you know kind of a group same you know whatever so even they what kind of money they are when they are buying so what is typically called over uh, you know uh, you know what is called uh, the under invoicing and over invoicing so when you are uh, you know selling something you 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 get an invoice of more than that and some money is passed off there and you are saying when you are buying something it is you know on paper it is less and some money is transferred from these account so lot of money is flowing it is bound to flow given right now the international circuits of finance and so difficult with tax havens and also difficult for big capital to be compound with you see this uh, you know as i said this pyramidal structure of this corporate sector because you are saying holding company is most likely structured not in india it is most likely you know its uh, home is somewhere in a tax haven mm -hmm. and how you you cannot hold it accountable so it to me it doesn't matter with an indian company or its so called quote and quote you know non indian company the consequences if you look at it for is almost you know the way it has become now today you know it's not what we earlier thought this is an indian company this is an international company especially when it comes to big indian capital I have another question, Raj, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. I so far it's just okay. me okay. after you. Okay. Um, this is related, but it's a little bit shifting the topic a bit. In terms of the use of uh, mobile uh, phones, how much of it is uh, just for communication? How much of it is social media? And it kind of ties into the question here in the US, there's tremendous consolidation in media in the media sector and the mobile uh, computing is really used as a means of controlling information and polit uh, political life. Is Can you just speak a little bit about how that might uh, tie into this very monopolized industry in India also? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're absolutely correct. Actually, uh, this is one thing which uh, I, have I have not studied because you can see this itself. But definitely two sectors which have really got, uh, you know, mobilized in a whatever it has become digitized in a huge way. One, as you're rightly saying, is this uh, the, 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 the uh, media sector. And you see, so if you go to a typical place around, people don't have, young people don't have jobs, but full time somebody is on their mobile. And therefore, not only mobile, then you are saying gaming industry, huge way. People may, you know, be ready to do anything to, to gaming and everybody is into this thing that through mobile, they will be able to make money out of it. So people may do anything, beg, borrow, steal, do burglary and burglary anything young people people don't have jobs so it's a huge thing uh, you know that media gaming and then what is happening in india systematically and to people like me uh, demonetization was very much part of it is the you know the whole financial sector what they call is as fintech is the digitization of the whole financial sectors other day just this last week some students of mine were doing some work on it there are 750 companies into trying to in India now giving various kinds of credit through phones. It's massive new kind of developments and thanks to cheap mobile, it's going to have massive implications, which we understand very little for the political economy of the country. Massive, massive. And uh, I, beyond a point, I don't understand, but I can see this kind of thing is happening, you know, in a, in a very, very systematic manner. And so this is uh, very defining. And that's why telecom industry needs to be understood better, I would say. I don't know whether I answered you, Ellen, but. 
Okay, so Alan, I'm going to move now. There are a couple other people waiting. I'm going to take a back seat, so I'll ask uh, Janet Cobrin and then Richard Fallenbaum. I don't know if they came in those sequence, but uh, I'll go in that. So Janet, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry if, if this was very difficult for me to follow, but uh, I have two questions. Can you talk about how unique these practices are, the practices you described, uh, when it comes to other capitalist ventures in other industries? And not necessarily in India, but anywhere. Um, and then the other question is, can you summarize what you talked about from a Marxist perspective? Okay, okay. Uh, I'll try to definitely answer the <laughs> first one. Second one, we'll see if we have uh, have something. So uh, first, what you're saying, unique. Uh, see, it depends upon how we look at it. So it's at one level, there's absolutely nothing unique about it. You know, I mean, uh, this is what happens. I think it becomes unique only if you put it in the context. And the context is the hype around telecom sector that you know, capitalists are giving it free and now everybody has access to, if no other service, then at least a mobile. And now the kind of way, uh, in a way that the ruling establishment in India is uh, leveraging everything, all kinds of things, as I said, media, retail, banking, education, health, everything, all sorts of things are being, you know, that you can leverage on cheap phone service and you it. So that's why it needs to be examined, uh, you know, carefully. Third thing, I would say the skills involved here are of a different order, given the intensity and given the kind of widely the service has reached. Uh, so the, its implications are much larger. So it's not that those accounting practices or those speculative practices or those financial financialization is something unique to Indian telecom. So and uh, so that's how I would look at it in the Indian context, and I would leave it uh, um, uh, there. Um, uh, Marxist, this thing, that's a large question. I'll uh, skip it. Maybe, uh, you know, we'll see if we have, we can converse about it some other time. Yeah. I'll leave it here. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we will have the next person is, uh, I'm going to go to Richard Fallenbaum, followed by Rich Johnson. Then if nobody else raised hand, then I'll take the turn. So Richard, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciated your your, your uh, description. And um, to underline what you pointed out, the, the great difference between a, a, a country, two countries with um, private ownership of the means of production, one in which the, uh, the working class um, controls the state and the other, in which the capitalist control state controls the state, that namely China and um, um, India, and it's a fundamental. <clears throat> you you show empirically um, the profound difference, uh, but it seems to me, um, in answer to um, Janet's question, um, that the, this is a suggestion that this is a general phenomenon. Um, of chaotic development and non uh, in an uh, indigenous development in, in in the whole Indian economy, it seems like um, the the Indian economy is heading for a major crisis at some point because it can't continue this way without without a domestic industry without it. it you know, it's it's building up, um, you know, in bricks and so forth. The North South um, uh, is based on the premise that India is going to 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 um, export value added products, and and that's going to break down pretty soon. And then uh, India will be in a. Any rate, please comment. So. Um... You you are saying that about the possibility of a breakdown. That's what Richard, your uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, you're correct there. I mean, um, you know, I have really nothing to add. I mean, the point is, I mean, really speaking, if you look around in India, if already it's not having broken down, and that's one kind of a thing I'm trying to say that at one level, there is so much of hype around India and it's, uh, you know, global elite, it's billionaires, it's uh, rulers and so on, fifth largest economy. At other level, really speaking, if you look at either at the macro level, like I'm pointing out, or even you look at day-to-day -day lives of people, there is already a breakdown of a certain kind. I mean, look at what is happening in India right now, the kind of, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, the mobs and so on, the kind of, uh, you know, the religious, uh, this thing being built up and uh, attack on the minorities. So it's already a certain kind of breakdown and somewhere its roots are in the crisis of the political economy of India. It's not just a mere cultural phenomenon or this phenomenon, like a lot of what liberals try to say. And you can see its roots in what uh, we are discussing. <laughs> and that's how I So already there is a crisis. Now, whether this is a breakdown or not, I mean, it's a very hard to say till, you know, we can perhaps see this kind of thing only with a, there is already a, a you know, serious, serious, uh, I mean, if not a breakdown, we are all the we are almost there. I mean, how do I say that it is not? We live our day-to-day -day lives in spite of all this chaos. That's how it is. Yeah, I have I have said. <clears throat> okay, so uh, if that is answers your question, Richard, then I will go to Rich Johnson. Rich, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, excuse me. <clears throat> um, the last two or three questions have um, inferred, I think, starting to move towards my question um, in one way or another. And that is uh, what I hear, if I step back uh, from all the details that you've said, is that... Um, and I really appreciated it. And it's way over my head. And I could listen to your program, this thing we just recorded uh, two or three times to try to really get into the depth of what you said. But if I look at it from the street, myself or my friends, or the people on the street here in the US or in India, walking around with a cell phone, oftentimes when they're crossing the pedestrian lane and not looking at the cars, looking at their cell phone, and I'm going, this person has a death wish. They, they walk out right in the middle of a wrong lot, uh, a red a red light and want me to hit them. So what I'm saying is, if the society now for the last uh, 20 years since this has been happening, and now at the moment, so many people have a cell phone, and it becomes part of their life every day. They use it for whatever, um, to talk to their friends or whatever, research. And uh, they become like as as we've used the car for the last hundred years in the U.S., we can, we become dependent on the automobile. As we use the cell phone for the last twenty years, thirty years, whatever, in a way, we we become dependent on the cell phone for what we use it for. And then the problem is, uh, if they take the car away, when our whole society is based on the automobile, you have to go shopping, you have to take your car or a bus or you know. But that's not very well developed. Uh, so I'm just saying, what happens when the price or whatever happens with the cell phones, where the price of the cell phone or the price of the service month to month starts to increase, where the capitalists that are running this show in whatever form, finance capital and with all the paperwork that you get, no paper, you can't even find the file that has the details of what's been going on for the last few years, you know, all their money's spread all over the place. You can't link it together and figure out what's going on. As this starts to break down, uh, as we've mentioned in general, the society, like you said, a few things about society starting to break down. We can see it. Same thing here. Uh, it's a different way, but a little different, but the same. What What's going to happen when people get cut off from their cell phone? They've become dependent on it. They've broken their relationships with all their friends, except through the cell phone, like we've done. You never see people except through Zoom or your cell phone. You hear what I'm saying? So I'm I'm drawing. I made. I think I've made my point. And how do you see that uh, 
when there's cell phones everywhere right now, but in the next year, two or five or whatever, because of this breakdown or that breakdown, people can't get to their cell phone anymore. It doesn't work anymore. The whatever the provider was isn't has gone broke, or maybe been eaten up by somebody else who changed the terms so much that they just can't use the phone anymore. That's my question. Thank uh, you, how do you Rich. Thank you, Rich. Rad, yeah. Rad, something? No, I'm just, I'm just saying. Thank you for go ahead to answer. I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I'll just not add uh, too many things to what you have said. I mean, and in India, I don't know whether it is happening in the US. I mean, there is a very, very systematic thing. There is a new economic policy which has come a couple of years back. Now, there is a very systematic, uh, this thing that, uh, you know, yes, uh, education can happen online. I mean, I have been a teacher for 30 years. You know, I'm not able to teach inside a classroom to young people. And what is this thing that uh, online one can teach? Online, you know, medicine can happen. Uh, finance, of course, it's where it will, you know, but this is how, you know, as you said, like automobiles restructured the whole society. Now we are saying that, uh, you know, mobiles are seriously going to, and of course, uh, they will do, uh, you know, as a reflection of the ruling system and as the way they want to it, till of course there is a resistance. So, uh, so it's it's a very very alarming situation, and it has become like an addiction. I mean, you go around here, the place there where I live, uh, this been maybe one of the most uh, you know uh, impoverished areas in in the in in country and in certain ways on the globe. You go around, you go to villages, you go to you know whatever the young people. What do they have to do? They have nothing else to. They are sitting with their mobiles. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they will do anything to get uh, add whatever the talk time into there because they can't live without it and they have nothing else to look forward to. So on, on the other hand, with this mobile, as you are saying, relationship to the whole world getting opened, I mean, this is what is their world. The mobile is their world. And uh, so this is has going to have very far-reaching consequences. You're correct. I'll, I'll leave it here. Okay. So next person is Eugene, followed, followed by Norma. And if nobody else has raised hand, then I'll ask a question. Okay, Jean, go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much. I confess I've had difficulty following this. I'm officially an old person and uh, my internet works. And that's all I care about. My iPhone I use to talk on. So a lot of this stuff is sort of beyond me. But uh, I wanted to kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about the larger geopolitical aspects of what's going on here. And I don't know if you can see this or not. It's a book called by Andre Gunder Frank called Reorient. And his point is very significant. And I think it, it kind of puts this in a different context is that, you know, Europe, he has concept of the development of underdevelopment that Europe didn't, the rest of the world didn't stand still while Europe in, industrialized. It was pushed backwards and de-industrialized by, uh, uh, you know, the, the imperialism. And so this is the other side of imperialism, so, sort of. But his point here is that, well, this, um, you know, what happened was the Occident, the West, you know, took power but what's going to happen now in the 21st century is it's going to re the world economy is going to reorient itself. And we're going to see the reassertion of China and India as the dominant powers. And the day of the West is, is over. And now the 21st century is going to be the Asian century. And uh, I, I find this, uh, you know, from the way my, my <laughs> mind works, I tend to think geopolitically. And I think it's a good thing to see uh, the, the non-Western world reasserting uh, it, its control. And I see your talk kind of fits into that, but I'm not sure exactly how, and I can't follow everything. So I don't know if you want to talk about that or what your thoughts on this whole matter is, but it's a good thing to see that non-Western people are not dominated by us white folks anymore. So. Uh, yeah, go go ahead. No, Eugene, you are correct that one way, but the other problem is that uh, that is the kind of a narrative our right wing nationalist governments will also like to you know that when they go to the international platforms, they will say that now India is reasserting, 
and then they will use this to you know uh, you know uh, crush under the boots any kind of dissent any kind of uh, you know questions uh, and when people ask about their rights uh, working classes ask about their rights in india and this is not only about india we know this is almost across the globe so the problem is this two sided thing that at one level yes it is good that the world becomes more democratic but if the democracy stops only at the you know the high table it's not going to really you know help uh, in any bringing any kind of uh, relief for the common folks and that is what we see in india so there is a lot of hype by, by our rulers right now that finally india has arrived etc cetera, etc cetera. and that in its own way is very problematic for people inside the country so that's the that's the issue i i've said what i wanted to say about it okay so yeah. no, i know that uh you know, China has talked about its sensory of humiliation. And I know uh, your ambassador, Jai Shankar, I think, uh, says, well, India had two centuries of humiliation. So, uh, yeah, but anyway, thank you so much for your talk. I, I followed it as best I can, and I know there's a lot of areas that uh, are beyond my understanding. So thank you for broadening my perspective a little bit. See, I'll just make one comment about you, Eugene, you know, thanks to this thing that when we say India's humiliation, India is a very, very heterogeneous country. When we say India's humiliation, it should not be only of India's ruling establishment. What about the rest of the people who every day have to live such an undignified kind of an existence in India? What about them? It should not happen when they are saying about India's humiliation, they come back and do the same thing to the rest of us that's where it's a huge problem this kind of uh, thing and china and india are, are different in that regard in terms of uh, the... not comment on china i'll leave it there but uh, india definitely i can say <laughs> okay well thank you all right so next is norma harrison raj are you going to put my video back um you have a video to show i have me you you've uh, you've reached yeah why don't you go I, ahead norma go ahead and start. We'll work on it okay thank you that expertise allen's he does that well go ahead and start norma no that's all i just want to have video access no. for my face on the okay. screen with everybody okay so you no questions or comment, Norma? Yes, I have nothing to say. You all have said it very well. Uh, I like Richard talking about the difference between Wall Street and capitalism as though there is one. I don't know if it's worth expanding about that. OK, so that's my turn then, uh, because I don't see any hands raised. So it seems to me, and it's going to be a little bit meandering common question. I'm trying to understand your entire presentation, and I think I've got broadly, but uh, so here what is happening is there is a, a grabbing of the market of telecom in which there is a consolidation taking place with uh, emergence of big finance capital in, inside India as well as tied with, with the ties to external capital which is much stronger. And so, um, so this, is, this is like what I read of Lenin describing 100 years ago happening in the context mostly of Europe, because uh, Asia was colonized at that point. So here, the difference with China seems to be the centralized state run by the Communist Party of China seems to have a better control on the process of development and monopoly. I think everybody, every country understands in this stage of monopoly capital that you have to have monopoly companies because otherwise you'll be wiped out in the world market. This was the thesis of Putin in when he did his PhD after he left his first job <laughs> and got to do a PhD in political economy that you gotta have a few strong companies that can sustain the global market. And I think uh, all said and done, this is what India's prime minister is trying to do is somehow develop monopoly industry in India. But here it seems like the system fails 
to develop it effectively is what, what I'm getting from your talk. And yet the thing is I see foreign companies, the investment is lost in India and this telecom, what I will say is they dash to get grab the market. And, uh, and there's very high level of speculation and uh, fraud and corruption going on, which of course is, is a massive scale in the United States and that we've seen in the last 30 years. Before that, it was a little more stable. So U.S. economy always had this in the periods of 1930s, a lot of fraud, a lot of this thing going on. But the difference is India is not developing its own internal technological power, which re requires, which has to be the anchor of the monopoly. I, this is what I get from your talk is that even the goal that's set by nationalists, whatever their character is, right wing or left wing is they're not able to do it because they cannot control the process and whereas a centralized party with a hundred year history and effectively is able to do in china although i i've seen all kinds of corruption going on in china as well uh, but all said and done their process is much more controlled i don't mean to get you into comment on china but in regards to India, I'm sure uh, the Prime Minister of India wants India to develop that capacity of monopoly. So why is it that they will the uh, ruling dispensation is indifferent to this kind of fraud? I mean, Adani's thing that we saw is he emerged as a big supporter and big one of the biggest capitalists who actually grew under this present uh, government to be even larger than the uh, to reliance for a while and and reliance itself was grew from uh, uh, from uh, and in, and in the military airplane deal reliance was given the same kind of thing by indian prime minister that uh, you know he's tried to create a monopoly in uh, aircraft manufacturing which also seems to have failed because they acted as a second fiddle to the French that was thing. Uh, not, not this Reliance Raj. That was a younger brother who has split. And that part oh. of the telecom story I did not talk about today because of the Okay. Of so my you, you get the drift of my question to you. Ah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You see, uh, one kind of a major issue here, especially when we are talking about uh, so-called developing countries, is that you cut it at one level, that's the strategy, each one of these ruling dispensations think that somehow by being able to incentivize uh, monopoly capital, they will be able to, you know, that's the, I mean, recently Niti Aayog, that is the planning commission of India, the new uh, avatar of planning commission. So they have a policy kind of an op-ed, uh, you know, this thing, they're right on their front page. They are saying, you know, that they have put all their eggs in the basket of big capital, and they are saying, so by incentivizing, by promoting them is the only way for India to catch up. That's what they are saying. And this is not for the first time. This has been the kind of story which we saw in telecom, but otherwise also for the last three decades. I think one big difference is that uh, the challenge is whether you will be able to, and that's where India's political economy becomes very, very peculiar at one level when you compare it with countries like China, is that whether you will be able to discipline, whether the state will be able to discipline the monopoly capital or not. And uh, today only uh, Manali is here. So apparently there is a Ford 2000, Forbes 2000 list about the largest companies in the world. And if you go, go to that Forbes 2000 list, it's available, all of us can access. Um, some of the top companies are Chinese companies and a large number of, I think 600 odd are American out of this 2000, 350 odd are the Chinese companies. But the interesting things, what Manali told me today, she's here so she can correct me, that those top five, out of top five, I think three, four are Chinese, especially if you look in terms of the assets. All of their apparently heads of these companies have been uh, gone to jail at some point or the other. Now, this is just, an, just a kind of a symptom or a kind of a data point. That this is absolutely unheard of that you will be able to uh, hold uh, the Indian big capital accountable. And you'll see this reflects in other ways, tax to GDP ratio. Now India's tax to GDP, tax to GDP ratio 
uh, for the US and amongst the developed countries, US is one of the lower ones, obviously, we all know why. But still, it is around 26, 27%, if I'm not. India's is hovering around 12% tax to GDP. Now, 12%, and if you are saying you have interest obligations, you have certain kind of different. So there is no money left for the people of the country to you know, be able to promote any kind of uh, you know, welfare sector. And if that doesn't happen, it has the consequences for the rest of the economy. You are saying, even if you promote monopoly capital, you have not developed domestic market. So this is huge difference from China. China underwent certain kind of land reforms during Mao's time, uh, et cetera. So there is a huge domestic sector there. You see, the problem is also today that a country like India for employment and for manufacturing, how much can it be, develop, be dependent upon international sector? Because international sector and given the present economic global economic crisis, it is limited. So these are other kind of challenges, which obviously today we haven't talked about. We restricted ourselves, but you can see that how then India's case, uh, you know, when you compare it with China, even if, it, you know, and other kind of uh, such countries which have been able to make certain kind of manufacturing and industrialized base, like other Asian tigers earlier than China, it becomes very problematic. But the hype is so much, and therefore we need to, you know, given the title of your this thing, we need to critically look at things and keep bringing it to public domain that you see what our ruling dispensation is saying is very different. Even if earlier it has been said in other cases, in other sectors, in other economies, we need to say it again and again because there is so much of hype about India's big business and the ruling dispensation today. You know, so yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I'm finished, Raj. Okay, thank you, Mario. I I saw Kit Vac was there, but I don't see her hand up. So Mario, please go ahead. Yeah, I really appreciate opening our eyes to the history of India. Um, I don't think we, as humanity, we can afford to speculate over and over again about the planet and humanity. It's just really a horrible situation we're in. My question is, um, can you talk a little bit about the history of the public service utilities in relationship um, to the history of colonialism in India and also um, net neutrality? Um, it, I don't know if, I'm sure you're familiar with it. So if not, I can explain it. All right, I'll, I'll restrict because I think already a lot of time, but very quickly, net neutrality, you see so far it is, but uh, there have been serious attempts now by uh, companies like Facebook, etc., to be able to get on the right side of the government. But there is a kind of a vigilant uh, all said and done because there is internet is so widely used in India. So, so far, uh, you know, it has not been compromised so much. I mean, but definitely it is going to happen. The present government doesn't like uh, at all, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, that, uh, you know, this uh, internet uh, me based media, because this is the only really speaking, only independent media left in India. And so they want to control it. There is a law which is so, so both when you say net neutrality, as far as the state is concerned, state wants to very heavily control it. And of course, the private sector wants to control it for Reliance Geo tried it, at, tried it one time when they did certain kind of, uh, uh, you know, sites will be bundled or certain kind of services will be build, bundled with their service, etc. So it has been attempted, but so far, if I say broadly speaking, it has been by and large uh, kind of, uh, you know, freely available in terms of whatever, though in, Indian government keeps banning sites, etc. Uh, and the private sector very easily complies with all of them left, right, and center, you know, at, at the drop of a hat. But uh, the point is that it will definitely, the way things are right now, if it doesn't change, it will change significantly uh, sooner than later. So that is your second. First question, you talk about the history of public utility services. Uh, am I, did I get you right, uh, uh, Mario? Yeah, yeah. Just like in contrast, you know, to... For sovereignty huh. for for yeah. people. So yeah. you see, uh, definitely, I mean, whatever was before 47, but after 47, one of the policy positions of uh, the, you know, uh, newly independent India was that commanding heights, as they said, quote, unquote, 
you know, uh, and this I think was also a part of a, a Bandung conference now where Indonesia, I think what uh, Nigeria, some of these countries, India were part of that. So after the Bandung, famous Bandung declaration, Samir Amin talks about it. So, uh, you know, um, this, uh, that commanding heights of Indian economy will be occupied by public sector, by the state sector, by public sector, I mean. And so a whole lot of these services, telecom, railways, power, at many of the strategic sectors like steel, many, you know, I'm not even talking about defense. All of this uh, state had, uh, you know, had the major say, if not the only say. But after 91, uh, you know, so-called economic reforms and structural adjustment program, all this has radically changed. And we are saying today where, where we are standing in the last three decades. And you see, the point is that these public services, which were built so painstakingly, so this was the only nation buildings really happened starting after in 50s, 60s and 70s. But by the time you could come to 80s, 81, I think India went to IMF, then 91 India went to IFF, all this started getting dismantled. And here we are today that you are saying, even if the services have, uh, uh, you know, exist in public sector, one, the whole ideological discourse around it. And two, you are saying if state is not willing to invest any money, then obviously it is not going to survive. So various reasons, uh, you know, see, you compare, for example, that the contradiction here that the government of India won't invest in their own public sector, BSNL, the telecom company, while it is so heavily invested in now Vodafone, this giving so much of such subsidy to Airtel and Jio and all the previous telecom companies. But this is the reality. This is the political economy of India. You can see it in telecom. You can see it everywhere. So that's how I look at it. Okay, with uh, thank you, thank you. that, our time is up and it's one o'clock in the morning for uh, Rahul and those joining from India. So thank you for staying up that late for us. I think we got an education here. And if you don't mind uh, putting your uh, articles in the chat, because uh, then we can, people can download it, the chat. If okay. you could do that, I will wait for a minute or two until you've done it. And then those who want to download the chat can read Rahul's article. And uh, and you can, if you want to answer questions further, if you have time, you can put your email address and people can reach you through that email. Yeah, Raj, if you, I'll do this. I'll first give you the links and then. Uh... Okay, yeah, put it in the chat. Are you putting it in the chat or do you want to me to do that? Ah, I, I can put it in the chat. Is that what okay, you Okay, thank you. Yeah, that would be. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609 or directly or donate online at 
www.paypal.me slash npml Info For information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org